So what we will do is again allow our two scholars and speakers to ask one another questions and we will begin with questions that Bishop Wright has. Thank you. I, I just have <clears throat> a couple of things. There are, there are of course thousands of things that I would like to take up and again I suspect that most of our disagreements are at least oblique rather than in most cases head-on. There are one or two head-on points but within a, a context where I think we're agreed about a lot. I'm fascinated though that you come back again and again to justification and sanctification as though those were the great categories. It seems to me that Paul has made it a abundantly clear that there is the call, the justification, and the glorification. Well, let's go to Romans 8.30. Why are you not using the categories that Paul gives and elevating, instead of glorification, the category of sanctification, which is at best within the argument of Romans a minor, uh, it's important, but it's minor compared with justification and glorification. And why are you then, it seemed to me in that last lecture, you were sliding justification back into call, into terms of Paul's thing because it is the call that is the transfer term for Paul. I, everything you say about the transfer, I thoroughly agree about the transfer from wrath to, to grace and all the rest of it, but it seems to me that is precisely not what Paul is talking about with justification. That's my first question. My second um, is, is to do with your very interesting argument about 1 Corinthians 15 and then Romans 5. 1 Corinthians 15 never was about justification, of course, it's about the resurrection, as we all know, and the only place where anything re remotely related comes in is in verse 56, as a kind of a throwaway right at the end, the curse of sin is the law, and we wonder what on earth that means, and then we go and read Romans 7 and we know. But in Romans 5, it's a, the climax of the summation of the argument so far, which is Romans 1 to 4 and 5, 1 to 11, and it's also visibly the foundation of the argument which is to come, which is Romans 6 through 8. And therefore, we shouldn't be surprised when in Romans 5 um, verses um, uh, 15, 16, and 17, Paul does explicitly, once you understand what he's, what he's, the way he's using these words, sorry, sorry, in ver verses, verses 18 and 19, I mean, he's talking about God doing this for all people, is pantas anthropus, is tikaios in zoes. That um, when we've read Romans 3 and Romans 4, it's clear that this isn't just, well, this works for everybody, guys. The whole point is that this justification is precisely for all, i.e., Jew and Gentile alike. That right stitched into the very heart, the passage to which you appeal, is the point which I've been making. Um, okay. You're going to have to keep me on track now in, in uh, responding to um, your question. The first one, um, I appreciate the way that was put. Uh, why sanctification rather glorification? And um, I should have made clear that I'm using sanctification. Uh, I think that term is, is used by Paul, but as uh, it would have, there would be a cluster of terms that would be involved that would have to do with renewal. Mm -hmm and the renewal that will then culminate in glorification. So I would, I, I see the way I would want to argue um, in, um, uh, that, I, that I want to construe the statement or the auto, uh, mm -hmm. the chain of Romans 8, 29, and 30 is that, uh, that it has to be seen in terms of already not yet eschatology mm -hmm. that, sure. so that what I'm calling sanctification, I, I think I could comfortably show from Paul is present realized glorification. <laughs> so I would have no problem right. there. Right. Now, um, yeah, uh, if, if there's value to my, re to my reflections on 1 Corinthians, uh, so my, my point is that, you, that um, I, just, I don't think we can just isolate you know, you could come back to me that I haven't um, worked carefully through the the uh, the, uh, the Romans five passage, but at the same time, I, I I think I would want to be insistent that what Paul is doing with the Adam Christ contrast in Romans five, um, it, it's not a different kind of contrast that he's developing in First Corinthians fifteen, even though he may have different issues in view there. So that uh, I guess I, I just, particularly the, the distinction between, uh, uh, you know, first and last, first and second there, it seems to me that those are implicit for him back in Romans 5. 
and, uh, and, and you, you, you can see my strategy that, that I think, points up that um, uh, the whole issue of justification um, seen in this light coming out of, uh, of coming uh, at its deepest ground in Romans 5, while it surely comes uh, to the concrete matter of hand, at hand of the mm -hmm. unity of Jew and non-Jew, uh, the, the issue of justification is, is deeper than that. So, uh, you know, I guess I could ask back to you uh, the way I thought to put it, um, uh, and I just, this is just more recent, so it's not something I've thought about a lot, and so you can maybe change my mind, but... Uh, <laughs> I wish. The ecclesiological... <laughs> uh, what's the problem with saying ecclesiological epiphenomenon uh, of sociological uh, core? Uh, the, the problem with that is that I just think that when we find in Galatians 2, for instance, which is, as I've said, where it starts, uh, the first great statement of justification, it, the business of Jews and Gentiles getting together at the one table is not an epiphenomenon of what he's talking about. It is the phenomenon of what he's talking about because, and I totally agree with you about justification language being forensic and declarative, not restorative. That's exactly my point. This is God's declaration. These and all of these are my people. It's not, I am gradually making them my people. It's this is who they are right now. It's that declaration which gives you the Antonian Cairo, the in the present time. We, we probably shouldn't take more about this, otherwise the present time is going to collapse into this debate. But uh, I... <laughs> I, we should probably leave it there and come back to it um, l late, later in tomorrow. Yeah, I think a lot of people come to Auburn Avenue conferences the same way people go to NASCAR. They want to see a big wreck. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> this was our first fender bender, I think. Do you want to predict how that's going to come out? Here? <laughs> no predictions. Okay, let me start with a question for Bishop Wright. And, and I think this addresses some of what has just been discussed, but it's, it's a very uh, short question. What does Paul mean in Romans 4 when he says God justifies the ungodly? Well, of course, short questions don't always permit of short answers. Um, <clears throat> uh, somebody once asked T.S. Eliot what he meant when he wrote... Uh, lady three white leopards sat under the juniper tree, and Eliot said, I meant lady three white leopards sat under the juniper tree. Um, <coughs> um, it surely means that Abraham, when he was called by God and promised the seed like the stars of heaven and the sand on the seashore, and he believed that promise, he was not at that stage circumcised and already part of this ongoing people of God. He was a pagan uh, by anyone's standards, etc., etc. But he believed God, and God declared, even while he was in that state of still being uncircumcised, etc., that he was um, part of God's family, that he was, the, the, the state he was in constitutes him, constitute him now as part of that family, the, the family through which the world was going to be um, redeemed. Uh, Ungodly is not a word that Paul often uses. It appears to be an echo of the, the similar word in Romans 1. Um, I don't know, how far can we go? Uh, it, it's, it's a way of saying that God is saying something about him despite the fact that he has no moral worth, no um, circumcised status, no virtue of parentage, etc. Um, and hence it's just this pure declaration. Okay, I've got a, a, another question about uh, Abraham now for Dr. Gaffin. When was Abraham justified? According to Hebrews 11, he already had faith in Genesis 12 when he left his homeland. Was this justifying faith? How does this relate to Genesis 15, 6, where Paul focuses, or Genesis 22, where James 2 says Abraham was justified by his faith and works together? Is there more than one justification event or more than one kind of justification? Yeah, um, to give uh, the short, direct answer to that question, um, I would say that Abraham is justified at the point that uh, he exercises justifying faith. And I think the case that would be best made is that that 
Faith is exhibited in his obedience. Um, well, it's there, in, I guess the way the question was phrased, in, in, in Genesis 12. And so I think that you can, um, you can you, the structure of just, I don't think it's, it's helpful to think of a constant being re-justified in the sense, uh, in a kind of quasi-Arminian sense of falling out of a state of justification and being brought back in, but the structure, well, <clears throat> if I could appeal as for helpful guideline here, I think uh, uh, um, faithful, uh, reflecting uh, Pauline and broader biblical teaching, uh, chapter 11 of the Westminster Confession talks about being introduced into a state of justification. Justification is in in, in one sense, a once and done deal, and yet it, 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 it is a reality of the life of uh, the believer so that at any point you can see justifying faith exhibited. Because the faith that, are, uh, that, uh, the faith that relies on Christ uh, initially at, at some alpha point for justification is no different than the faith that continues, perseveres in relying on Christ. Hmm. So I guess those are our hmm. uh, first things I say to that. Is there something else I should say? Or, uh, <laughs> we, we might be able to squeeze in another question for each of you. Uh, Bishop Wright, you have suggested that God elected Israel. This is a corporate historical election. But does scripture ever refer to individual soteriological election? And if so, where? Hmm. Um, Election, the trouble is here, as with several of these other debates, that the words which are used sometimes rather infrequently in Scripture itself have become technical terms within Christian dogmatic theology. This is the point that I have quoted and I've seen quoted back at me um, from Alistair McGrath's book on justification where he admits that at least from Augustine onwards, the church has used the word and the language of justification to denote something subtly different from uh, the rather specific job that that word has in, uh, in Paul himself. And so with election, um, in Romans 9, Paul talks about God's purpose in election in relation to individuals. And that's a tricky one because what he's doing there, and, we, and it's perhaps significant, we haven't actually talked very much about Romans 9 yet, but it, it's a very, very important passage, is that there he is arguing that when you tell the story of the history of salvation or whatever you want to call it, starting with Abraham, it isn't simply that all members of Abraham's family are uh, part of that covenant family through whom God's purpose is to be accomplished, but that God selects from within that. And that's when he says that God's purpose in election might stand not according to works, but according to the call. So you get Isaac, not Ishmael, Jacob, not Esau. And, and so far, the book of Jubilees would agree. But then beyond that, of course, it gets narrowed down further and further and further by Paul, following the prophetic tradition, until in um, two-thirds of the way through chapter 9, you have, if the Lord of hosts had not left us sperma, a seed, we would have been made like Sodom or Gomorrah, which is a quote from Isaiah 1, of course. Um, so what you've, what you've got there is something to do with the choice of individuals to carry that purpose forward. And Paul does not address the question that we who have read Luther and Calvin uh, and indeed many others before and since, Aquinas for instance, uh, always want him to address, which is the ultimate predestinarian question. Does God actually before all time um, determine that certain persons will be elected, chosen, predestined for salvation? Um, he seems determined to stick with his question, which he's much more interested in, which is how God's redemptive historical plan is being carried forward through the people of Israel. And then within that, in relation to specific individuals as it's getting narrowed down. So it, even there, that's as close as I think we can get, but even there, that isn't about what we would mean if we said the phrase, the election of individuals, because that, that's within that larger context. Okay, for uh, Dr. Gaffin. Is it possible for Christians to keep the law of God? We're sinners, but the Bible often describes covenant members as righteous and blameless. For example, Luke 1.6. What does this language mean? It means what it says. Um, <laughs> the, um, 
I guess I'm not I'm not real clear where the where the uh, the question is coming from. I I think it's it's the case um, that of what Romans eight four says hmm. that the effect is that the demand of the law will be realized, fulfilled. However, you want to nuance that in those who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And um, um, I, I would certainly. What I go on to say about sanctification, as that will come up in, the, in, in this evening's lecture, uh, perhaps I'll shed more light on that, but um, I certainly wouldn't want to put it negatively, anything that I've said so far, uh, to, um, to uh, exclude or suggest that there is not a real positive um, law-keeping, law-guided obedience in the life of, of the believer there, in terms of our Reformed tradition, a third use of the law. But perhaps I've misunderstood where the question is, is coming from. Could, could, could I have a little stab at that? Uh, I think when, uh, Paul himself says in Philippians 3 that concerning righteousness under the law he was amemptos, blameless, and I glossed that before by saying that that doesn't mean he was what we would call sinlessly perfect, but it meant that he maintained his status because every time he did anything which he didn't mean to do against the law, he would offer the sacrifice, he would make repentance and restitution, and thus continue with an unbroken status. Um, this relates to some of the questions, some of the debates we were having outside um, in relation to the idea of pleasing God. Is it possible to please God? Many in the Reformation tradition have been very worried about any idea that anything we can do would actually please God. Paul is not worried about that at all. He insists in 1 Thessalonians, this is how you ought to live and please God. In, in Romans 8, the passage you've just quoted, um, it goes on to say that the mind of the flesh cannot please God, but you're not in the flesh, you're in the spirit. And then in Romans 12, he says, therefore you need to learn by the transformation of your mind what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is what God wants. So, uh, and I would say that that possibility did not start when Jesus died and rose again, but by God's grace, already in Israel, the faithful in Israel, right through, there was always that option, and that old Anna and Simeon in the temple and Zachariah and Elizabeth and so on, the beginning of Luke, were exactly in that category. Okay, thank you very much. That uh, exhausts our time, and we will now close our session. Exhausts our speakers too, yeah. <laughs>